But without further ado, I would like to introduce our amazing facilitator for the day, who's also an alum, also pursuing grad school. If we can give her a huge round of applause, Kathy Tong. And Good she'll morning. kick us off. She will kick us off. Go ahead, Kathy, the floor is yours. Thanks, Matt. And thank you, Helica, for putting this together as well um, for the pro staff who um, got all the panelists together in the first place. Just to start off with the event, hello everyone. Like Matt said, my name is Kathy. I am currently a grad student here at SJSU in chemical engineering, and I will be serving as a moderator for this event today. And just because the spotlight's not on me, I'll now pass it to our amazing panelists who are here today just to um, start off the intro. So Giovanna, may I please have you introduce yourself first? Hello everyone, my name is Giovanna Mendoza. I also go by Jojo. I'm a Kit Forward advisor. So do I introduce my role too or the question number one or just, oh yes, also question number one. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's okay. Okay, so my name is Giovanna Mendoza. I'm one of the, um, I'm a post-secondary success advisor for Kit Forward. This is a program that supports their high school seniors apply for their post-secondary pathway. And also we support our first and second years in higher education, providing them advice, services, support, and just navigate higher education in a way that supports their learning style and transition. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much, Giovanna. And with Diana, we'll have you um, introduce yourself as well. Yeah, sure. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Diana. I I am a former SJSU student, so I'm a recent grad. I graduated spring 2022. Um, my major was biomedical engineering. And I was actually a former peer advisor under MEP. So it's good to be back working with our team again, but as a panelist this time, um, I'm currently a grad student right now at um, Keck Graduate Institute in Claremont, which is in Southern California. That's kind of a life science based um, grad school. And if you hear any background noise, I apologize in advance because I am on campus and it's the lunch hour. So people are coming into the common space. Um, but I'll try to keep it as quiet as possible. But yeah, I'm excited to get to talk to you all and, and get to know you all a little more through this panel. All right, before I dive into the questions, this is just a friendly reminder to all of you all here. Um, if you all could put on your um, cameras, um, that would be amazing for the panelists as that would just amplify your presence here on the Zoom space. Um, but remember to keep your microphone off throughout the duration of the event until we have open Q&A. But of course, if you're a little bit shy, don't worry. We also have um, Zoom chat available for you to, in, to interact with all the people here as well. But first question, I'll ask this to Jojo first. Um, what motivated you to pursue your current graduate program? Yes, so I'll, I forgot to add this introduction, but I'm an SJSU alum. I got my uh, BA in social science teacher preparation with a minor in Chicano studies, and I graduated in fall 2018. Um, I went to grad school at University of San Francisco. I got a master's in teaching with a single subject teaching credential, and I, it was a two-year program, and I finished May 2021. So what really motivated me to pursue my current grad, uh, the program I did, um, Honestly, was my current uh, career goals at that time and wanting to know the graduate school process um, is really what motivated me. At that time, I wanted to be a high school teacher. So I knew that going to grad school, getting my teaching credential will prepare me for being a high school teacher. And also I worked as an advisor during that time. So me going through the process of applying to grad school would allow me to support my students when they brought that conversation to me of wanting to apply to grad school, what things to think about when applying to grad school. And that was a huge motivator for me to be like, let me learn as much as I can, ask all these questions. So like that when I support my students in the process, I'm able to provide as much insight as possible. So that's what really motivated me to apply. Fantastic, thank you. Diana, same question to you. What motivated you to pursue your current graduate program? Yeah, so um, for me, I think I decided to pursue grad school just out of a desire to be ethical. And what I mean by that is I studied biomedical engineering when I was at SSU. And during that time, I, did, I wanted to go into regulatory affairs, which is the FDA and making sure that medical devices and pharmaceuticals that are on the market are safe and effective. So that's actually what I'm studying now. And I just felt that when I left SJSU, I wasn't ready to take a, on a full-time job in that space. I didn't feel like I had the knowledge base to be dealing with such 
kind of legal and ethical matters. So I wanted to pursue that further and make sure that when I am going to a company and providing them with advice, I'm ready and I'm knowledgeable. So I kind of went out and just got that for myself because I wanted to provide the best um, possible information to companies. And then that obviously trickles out into uh, patients that are using the products that the FDA um, okay. Thank you both for answering that question. I kind of get the lot that you both are very selfless people already. Like your community is so lucky for you both to be pursuing what you're pursuing, serving somebody else. Like that's just timeless. And that's, I can't, I have, I have no words. That's just an amazing first response to both of you guys. So we're giving you guys like that whole acknowledgement that the community is very lucky to have you both pursue what you're pursuing and also with the intention that you're going to it with as well. So Jojo, back to you with this next question. What resources did you utilize to help you select um, a program and navigate the application pro um, process? Yeah, I think when applying to a graduate program, it could definitely feel very overwhelming. So I would say definitely start with these two things. Uh, for me, what really helped me start and get grounded was looking into my community and the program's website and staff. So my community at the time, I was actually a UPS student as well. So I remember going to Matt and I remember going to Adam and all these advisors on campus and I was asking them all these questions. So I was like, what advice do you give? What did you look into when you were applying to grad school? So definitely looking, turning into my community, turning into my mentors, my supervisors, those who have done it before me already, my professors, and just talking to them, having conversations with them, asking them why they went to grad school, what was their purpose for that degree? How did they navigate grad school? And of course, the program's website and their staff was a huge resource for me. So uh, when I was applying to University of San Francisco, I was looking at their program. What grants did they offer for students? What scholarships were available? Um, I also looked at some most graduate programs offer workshop events, and this allows you to go kind of similar to this, and they have a presentation about the program, what they offer, and then at the end, they also have a Q&A, so you get to ask all the questions you have. I definitely had a list of questions for those workshops, and this also allows you as a student to see, like, is this program something that's, like, interesting for me? Is this what I'm looking for? I know for me, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion was super important for a program to have. And when I was going to these workshops, these presentations gave me that glimpse of like, does this program focus on the identity of our students in the classroom, their learning styles, all these different things that I was looking for as an educator to learn and practice more. Um, so I would say to keep it more simple, definitely your community, the websites. Um, I made appointments with the staff too. I had follow-up questions. I wanted that one-on-one -on -one, um, meetings to answer more, more of my questions. So I remember reaching out to the advisor of the program. I sent her an email um, and I was like, hey, I'm interested to learn more about your program. Can we schedule a one-on-one? -on -one? Um, we did that and she provided so much insight, so much information. And honestly, after that meeting, that's when I made my decision. I'm just going to apply to this one program. And I felt super confident applying to one program and believing that if this program was for me, I was going to get in. So um, I would definitely say, use your resources, your mentors, your community, and talk to those that have done it before you. Fantastic, thank you, Jojo. Now, Diana, same question to you again. What resources did you utilize to help you select a program and navigate the application process? Definitely, so um, I'm gonna echo Giovanna here and basically everything that she said. Most of the resources that I used came from SJSU. So like just reading the emails that are sent out, you find out about different programs from all across the country that are cool and interesting from your department. I know my department for sure sent out a lot of different opportunities. They had speakers come and I went and I listened, just like Giovanna said, and asking for those one-on-one -on -one meetings, asking for advice. And also one of um, kind of my mentors on the path was Matt when I was going through this process because he gave me the advice of if you're going to grad school, it should be because that program does something for you, not just because you feel like you need to go to grad school. There should be something about the program that um, is going to benefit you more than, you know, any other program if you're applying. So it's kind of different from undergrad in that sense, or at least that's what Matt taught me that you don't have to go. You go because the program offers you something. So just listening to people and 
um, just kind of seeing what the different programs offer and what might be a good fit for you and what aligns with your goals. The more you know, the more of an informed decision you can make, I think. So definitely SJSU and the staff and just listening. Love it. I love both of your answers. I think like my biggest takeaway just from hearing you both is just you're using your um, grad program as a tool just to move forward. You're not using it as a necessity to achieve what you want to achieve, but you're using, you're leveraging the programs and the benefits and also starting the communication early with the people leading in the first place, just to kind of see how it is that you fit and how it is you want to use that to fit into your future ambitions, your goals, and want the things that you want to do for yourself and also the community you ultimately want to serve. So I love that you're both tying it back to your goal and your purpose. So next question, going back to Jojo again. Okay, so this one does hit a little bit home. As a first generation, what were the biggest challenges you had to encounter as a graduate student? I actually really loved uh, thinking about this question because I never really thought about that after I graduated. I was like, all right, I'm graduated, I'm done, let's go. <laughs> let's get out of here and let me start working and doing what I went to grad school for basically and just help my students. So I would say the biggest challenge I faced, especially, especially as a first gen, um, navigating, my, my, navigating higher education was honestly my work performance and believing that it was enough in my best work. Like when I was writing this, I was like, oh my God, I can't believe that was the hardest thing. But honestly, that was the hardest thing. Um, my cohort was about 18 of us and out of and 15 of them were already classroom teachers. So I was like one of the four or three that weren't teaching in the classroom. Um, and I was honestly one of the three youngest ones as well. So they were all in their like late twenties, early thirties. I was like, oh my gosh, like there was like three of us that were like the babies, seen as the babies. And um, again, I wasn't a classroom teacher like they were. They already had all this experience in the classroom. So I remember looking back at those two years and it, uh, the, the anxiety and just the doubt I had when I would sit down and do an assignment, I would ask myself like, oh my God, is this good? Is this enough? But I think it went back to like my thoughts thinking like my peers are already classroom teachers. They have the practice and they know what they're doing. That's what I would think. So I think that would just make it harder for me when I was doing my own work um, for like presentations and all of that. But I would say um, what really helped me was asking questions. Um, cause I thought back, I'm like, okay, this was something I struggled with. What did I do about it when I was a student? And I was thinking back and what I did was I would ask questions in the class to my peers and use them as a resource as well. And, you know, hear them out, ask them questions like, oh, I've been doing your classroom. Like when this happens, what do you do? Like, what would you advise me to do? So I would definitely, again, grad school is a place for you to learn, build community, um, and have your support system and checking in with my professor was a huge resource and reminding myself that I am learning and to not compare myself to my peers and others experience like they've had this practice teaching already for a few years I can't compare myself to someone that's done it for years has learned and trialed and error and all of that for someone that I never even had my own classroom at that time so um, remembering myself and that uh, I was learning and that's what we're there for grad school for to learn to try something out, see if it works. If it doesn't, all right, let's try something else. Um, and just remembering that you're in your own journey. So that was definitely one of my biggest challenge. Fantastic, thank you. Diana, back to you again. As a first generation, what were the biggest challenges that you had to encounter as a graduate student? Um, I'll definitely echo Giovanna again. I think just believing that you belong here. I've only been in grad school for a little while, but I'm still um, still feeling a little bit out of place, I guess you would say, just because um, a lot of my classmates are a lot older than me. Like Giovanna said, they have a lot more experience. And in undergrad, you think, you know, people do have similar experiences. A lot of people are the same age as you and you feel equal in a sense, maybe like for those of you that are in MEP, you can see the effect that, you know, your parents not going to college has on you. You feel it even more in grad school because you have students who are just excited even more when you're in grad school. But you kind of just have to talk yourself into a place of, I do belong here because I got in here. The school decided that um, 
you know, I was qualified to be here and you kind of just have to go with that. And I think another one of the things that I've been struggling with is that feeling of belonging, but in a more professional setting. So like trying to apply for internships as somebody with a bachelor's degree, um, that's what I'm kind of working on right now and interviewing and they're really pushing us here. And I find myself struggling with that a little bit just because I am first generation. My parents still don't understand really what it is that I do. My family doesn't really understand. And I think that's true for a lot of us in engineering, um, but even more so in grad school because you're just so advanced. You're learning things that, um, you know, other people, it's a whole new language. So um, just to kind of tie it back, I think believing that you do do belong where you are and kind of being your own promoter, I guess, in a sense, in the professional setting and having that confidence. That's something that I'm struggling with right now, but you just kind of have to talk yourself into a place of, of knowing that you do belong here. Thank you both. I really do appreciate that you're both tying back to being your biggest self-advocate. Uh, as a first-gen student, you don't really have much to go on. Like the people around you or close to you don't can't really get a firm grasp of the place that you're in. And no matter what education level you're pursuing, like there's still that kind of sense of, am I really fit to be here? Do I really have what it takes to make it through this program and like do what I got to do? But in, but you're both addressing the reality that you both bring such intrinsic value to the program that you're bring yourself and inserting yourselves in that comparing yourself to your coworkers or to your colleagues is just it's not going to be your to your benefit and you did mention this jojo that it's not um it's not worth comparing just because they are on, on a different like field than you they all have their separate goals but you're you deserve your space here just as much and diana tying it back to confidence it does play a big role um i think throughout like multiple like uh stages in like your education or like even in professional life, confidence is a big key. Being yourself advocates a huge key, and just knowing that you bring so much intrinsic value to the table in whatever team that you're in is something to always like, reassure yourself on. So I think that's very lovely points and very important points that you both touched on in your um, in your responses, and that actually alludes to the next question, which is about imposter syndrome. Um, Joe, I'll start with you again. So, did you ever have to navigate uh, imposter feelings while? being in your graduate program or while you were applying? Yeah, so uh, looking back at when I was applying to my program, I think I didn't feel imposter feelings um, just because I had the support and guidance from my mentors, my professors, and they really helped me feel like I can do this. Like they've done it, they're first gen, like I can do it too. So I feel like that really helped me not have those feelings when I was applying. And it was also because I was really clear on what I wanted and why. Like I mentioned at that time, I knew I wanted to be a teacher. I had to go get a credential to be a teacher in the state of California. So for my career goals at that time, there was no reason to really wait. Cause I get the question all the time, should I wait, should I not? And it's like, it goes back to your own career goals. What's the purpose and what's your why for that degree? So I think when applying that, that really helped me not feel those imposter feelings. However, um, and I also had this, the support and the mindset that if this program was for me, like I mentioned, I only applied to one program, I was like, they will accept me. Um, and that was the energy I was going in with, the mindset, and I really believed I would get in that program. Um, but I did have imposter feelings in my program when we would teach each other in the program. So a little bit like I mentioned, a lot of my classroom teachers, uh, classmates were teachers already, and we had to teach each other and like, you know, practice what we were learning and all of that. Oh my gosh, I remember like coming up and I would just like that freeze response. I would just like get stuck. And I was like, oh my God, why am I freezing? Like, I remember at EOP, we would do summer bridge, we would present, we would do all these things. I was like, why am I freezing so much? And again, I would just like, I think unconsciously, I was like, they know more what they're doing than I do. Like, cause that we would, we would teach in a group. So it was like five of us teaching the classroom. And it was so intimidating te teaching teachers that already were in the classroom. And again, I wasn't teaching. So that's when I, I wouldn't, I think I did question sometimes like, do I belong? But I knew I needed that credential to be a teacher. Like I went back to my why and my goals. I was like, I wanna be a teacher and this is what I have to do to get there. So figure it out, Jojo, and make it work. And um, at that time I was an academic advisor. And I remember when I was working with my peers, they really liked my advising lens when we were teaching things. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. Like I didn't think, because it's a teaching program, you know? So um, yeah, I think uh, definitely imposter syndrome feelings 
the fact that they were classroom teachers and I wasn't. And again, I learned that comparing their experience to me impacted my confidence in the classroom when I was a grad student. And that didn't serve me. Um, so I definitely realized that. And I continue to practice that now in my jobs and my roles when I'm trying something new. I just feel being first gen and trying something new, all these feelings and things come up. So I just take myself back of like, when did I feel this before? And how can I shift my mindset to a way that serves me? And again, I'm learning. So it's part of the process. Thank you so much. All right, Diana, same question to you again. Did you ever have to navigate imposter feelings in your graduate program or while you were applying? Um, I think I kind of have a little bit of a different perspective on this. I didn't feel so feel it so much when I was applying um, just because my school made the application process pretty easy and I already had experience with the school by doing a summer program here. So I felt pretty confident in that sense and I knew that my background had prepared me and I had the coursework behind me to land myself a spot in the program. Um, you know, obviously still hopeful, but um, I felt pretty confident that, like, in my abilities, I guess you could say, but even when I got here, I still feel imposter syndrome more outside of the classroom than I do inside the classroom, just because I feel like my undergraduate experience has prepared me really well for the program that I'm in. I know a lot about what the professors are talking about. It's a lot of things that I've heard a little bit before I'm familiar with the terminology and I don't know if this is specific to just my school or if Jojo maybe you've experienced this too but everybody in grad school I think comes from so many different backgrounds in their undergrad that some people are going to catch things more easily than others like I said for me I've heard a lot of the terminology before so I feel very comfortable in my classroom but still outside of the classroom like in professional settings like I was talking about in the last question I still feel imposter syndrome um just kind of that do I do I belong here and you know we talked about talking to yourself out of that but, but also at home I think it's hard to not be able to talk to the people around you like in your home life about what you're doing every day and that can be kind of isolating so I think I feel kind of reverse imposter syndrome in that way so it's kind of interesting but where I feel really comfortable in the classroom but I feel kind of like an outsider outside of the classroom if that makes sense so that's something new that I'm learning to deal with but I think it's kind of interesting that we have opposite perspectives on it. Thank you both so much for your insight. So I'm going to bounce questions a little bit, since one of the biggest things that deter people from grad school to begin with is funding. So I'll ask Jojo this question first, um, just to kind of get your um, both your perspectives on how you're putting yourself through grad school. But how is it exactly that you're funding um, your grad school journey or how exactly what resources did you use to tap into to actually help get you through grad school? Yeah, so when I was applying to grad school, um, I remember I knew I had to pay out of pocket since I left to college. I had to provide for myself financially and all of that. So I knew this was going, going to be part of the process. So um, I was working full time when I started grad school. So that really helped me. Um, but I knew, okay, let me take it a little bit back. When I was applying to graduate programs for teaching programs, there are some of them that don't actually allow you to work full time because just the way the curriculum and the way the program runs. You have to be in the classroom teaching with a mentor teacher. So when I was doing my research, I made sure to look for a program that fit the lifestyle that I needed at that time, which was to still work full time and go to grad school full time. So with that being said, I did fund my program by working. And um, when I was doing my research, I also looked at their programs, grants, scholarships, um, and I, when I went to the advising meetings with the advisors from the program, I would ask them, what services do you all provide to support your students financially, um, academically, all those things that I think are very helpful for a student when navigating higher education. Um, I also did take out loans. I took out loans to apply for grad school. And um, when I was doing my research, I remember my program had like a grant that would pay like 40% of your tuition for the two years if you volunteered your time at specific schools. So I made sure to inform myself on what were my options and how can I pay for this. Um, and again, for me uh, as a student, like funding my education is an investment in myself. So I, I, I just knew, let me just get informed as much as I can with what resources, which were grants, scholarships. I applied to 
four and I think I got two out of the four um and then I think well honestly y'all I also got a scholarship I forgot about this I got a scholarship after I met with an advisor because I was telling her yeah I'm still making trying to make my decision I am looking into different programs which I was I was also looking at Santa Clara um and after that meeting I don't know where she's like oh we actually select a few of our uh, students um, and we grant them a scholarship and she just gave me a scholarship so just because I went to go talk to her so again I don't know if every program does this every program is different but just use your resources talk to your advisors of the program they know their program best so go ask them if you're not really sure and you're not able to find that on the website thank you so much Georgia, for answering that question and then Diana now back to you as well so how is it exactly that you're funding your way through grad school or um, what resources are you also tapping into to help fund yourself too? Um, yeah, so the way that my school has it set up is you basically have to borrow everything that you need, pay it up front, and then, you know, if you can't pay it out of pocket, which is my current situation right now. So what I did was borrow everything that I needed to pay the tuition and then past that they offer you up to the cost of living which is your housing your books they have a determined amount for the school that's the cost of living that you're allowed to borrow and luckily i'm living at home right now but i was still able to borrow up to that cost of living so i took out the full amount and um, i'm gonna use it sparingly the excess so my tuition is all paid for the loans i did get a couple of scholarships um but I think the biggest thing is just managing any excess money that you do get if you choose to do it that way. I'm trying to be very careful with how I budget out that extra money that I took out and making sure that I pay back whatever it is that I don't use. Um, but just because of the nature of my program, I'm not able to work full time. It's a during the day program, I guess. It's not a it's not an after work program. So. Um, I could work part-time, but I decided to give myself a break for this semester just to try out grad school and um, just to kind of take a rest because I was working at MEP for three years during my undergrad. So just taking a little break from that. Um, I'm thinking about getting maybe a part-time job on campus again, um, maybe next semester or later this semester if they're looking. So I think just being very careful with what you're borrowing, um, being vigilant about that, making sure you're not over borrowing and working if you can, but I always say this as a piece of advice, don't work if it's going to cause you to be failing classes because that just doesn't make sense. It's gonna make you stay longer and make you pay more overall. So you're better just taking out the money, trying it out, making sure you pass. And then um, once you do have a job and can pay back the money, then you, know, you won't have wasted another year just because you wanted to work while you were going to school. So you kind of have to weigh that for yourself. And I did that for myself this semester. And um, I guess I'll see what the next semester holds. Thank you both for sharing how you're um, sharing how you both are still prioritizing your degrees, even as you're navigating your finances. Finances are honestly really tough for a lot of people. I think a lot of us can agree that it's still an ongoing thing that can be a stressor in life, but it's definitely one of those things where like being in the grad program, like you decided to put yourself in the space to use it as a leverage and a tool your ongoing goals so it will pay off i think that's just like what we have to tell ourselves that our work now in grad school will ultimately pay off and second the last question before we kind of wrap up the event and go to q a before we wrap up and everything uh, but jojo i'll go back to you again we're asking more about time management now so how are you navigating being a grad student concurrently while working so yes time management and prioritizing was for me to be able to navigate higher ed in general for my BA and grad school and all of that. Um, I would say um, staying organized, prioritizing, and setting boundaries is key. Like those are a must. And um, again, if you feel you struggle with some of these areas, talk to your mentors, talk to your advisors and see what advice they might give. Even Google it or YouTube it. Like you have to find a method and a tool that works for you. For some students I would use planners, for some students that didn't work. So we found something that worked for them. Um, so I was saying definitely finding your tools that work for you. Um, for me, I would say staying organized helped me to know realistically how much time I actually had and when I should start an assignment. So I feel sometimes as students, you know, we have multiple classes, multiple things, so we feel like we have all these assignments, but realistic, if you get a calendar out, 
and map out when they're actually due and how much time you have in between, you'll get to see that it's definitely doable. You just need to start earlier than you think you needed to start. Um, for you to uh, also release that stress, um, and I noticed I did this during undergrad and grad school, and this really helped me not to feel overwhelmed to the point that I'm like, this is not going to get done. Um, I actually never submitted a late assignment in undergrad or grad school, um, and it was because of this method. Um, teachers definitely in grad school were very flexible, but I'm like, if I use that, I'm just going to keep stacking assignments. So that was a method that, I, again, it takes practice. I didn't figure it out in one month, and I was like, oh my god, I'm perfect at everything. I had to try things out and see, again, what works for you as a student. Um, so I would say definitely organizing, prioritizing. Um, it's very important too because it will allow you to know what to focus on first again you might have a lot of assignments you might have work you might have all these things so realistically having like your time what comes first um if you only have two hours or one hour that night how about you start with a small assignment or whatever works best for you but each thing will have a designated day and time and this will help you not to feel again overwhelmed and stressed out and burnt out um, and also this will allow you to put some self-care in there like i remember i was telling one of my friends i was like during the week, I worked till six and then I had homework or I had class. I was like, but I would tell myself by 10 p.m. I'm closing my laptop regardless or by 930. I think it was 930 or nine. I would close my laptop and I would just lay down, be on my phone, watch TV, whatever. But I had to do that for myself to not feel burnt out. Um, and important and lastly, boundaries. Your time will be limited. So it's super important to know when you will need to say no to make sure you use your time wisely. I had to say no to going out. I had to say no to birthdays. Like I had to, I think birthdays were the only things I would say yes to, but I would prepare for that. Again, I would take out my monthly planner for their birthdays in September. It's like, okay, their birthdays this day. How can I push these assignments earlier or all of that? So monthly, calendars help me look at something holistically and four weeks to give me enough cushion time. Um, and remembering that when you start saying no, you might feel a little guilty, especially as a first gen, you might start feeling guilty if you say no to your family or your friends or people around you, but it's like realistically your time is limited and you, and it, again, it's, it's not forever. It's only for one, two, three years that your program is running for. So I would say organized prioritizing and setting boundaries is super important to take care of yourself as well. And, you know, prioritize your goals at this time in your life. Thank you so much. And then I'll reframe the question a little bit for Diana, since um, she's currently not working. But Diana, I know you, you're a boss at time management as well. Can you please share with the audience how it is that you're practicing time management while in grad school? Yeah, definitely. So our group, um, we kind of learn those things in undergrad and I think we take them with us. One of the things that I've learned while being in grad school is that you do have a little bit more freedom to say no to things because you're um, working with people who may have families or they have full-time jobs and they're trying to balance all of that too. So if you need to say no to a meeting at, you know, from 12 to one o'clock, everybody's going to understand like, no, I need to eat lunch. Can we not meet at that time? So everybody kind of understands that. Or if you need to do what Giovanna did and say, you know what, at 9.30, I'm logging off. I'm not, I can't do this anymore. Um, or I have other responsibilities to take care of. I think people at this level understand that and it's a little bit different in that way. But for me, still like staying organized, like Giovanna said, um, I still use a planner. I still use Google Calendar. Um, I use Canvas religiously, just staying on top of it, checking everything. Same things that we do in undergrad, I'm carrying through. Um, but I've also learned, again, like what she said, self-care, to make sure you're eating, make sure you're sleeping, because it does have a, a big effect on your productivity throughout the day. And also learning what times of the day you're best at doing certain things, like maybe you're more energetic in the morning, so you want to do your assignments in the morning and then go to class, or just where you put your energy needs to reflect the natural cycles of your day, I guess. And I think since I've learned that, that's helped a lot. And that's helped with my productivity um, in a big way, too. So just a lot of those things, really knowing yourself and managing yourself, I guess. And like she said, setting expectations with other people. No, I can't meet at that time. Or if somebody asks for your availability and you really don't want to take a meeting on a Wednesday because that's your day to yourself, then you start your availability on that Thursday. So it just... 
I guess, learning how to set those boundaries for yourself. Thank you both so much for your insight on time management. That's something that all students, whether we like it or not, we struggle with. Professionals will eventually struggle with this. It's a different ball game, no matter what stage we're at. And it's really insightful just kind of hear similarities, but also differences in how you both are setting your boundaries and setting your tools to help you time manage and ultimately that works best and it is advantageous to you. So my last question to you both before we jump into Q&A is, Jojo first, of course, what advice would you give to someone who is considering going to grad school? I have so much advice, but I would keep it, I will keep it simple. Um, I would advise to take, to really take the time to know your why for pursuing this grad, graduate school in a specific degree. Um, I think it's very important to know this because this will help you navigate the program when things get challenging, when doubt kicks in, um, and when all, life happens. So I think this would definitely help you to go back to like your why, like kind of like I shared earlier, like I was teaching with my classmates and I started questioning like, oh my God, they know what they're doing. Like, it, but again, I went back to my why. I want to be a teacher, so I have to do this. Like it, it's, it's part of the process. So I would say knowing your why for the program is very helpful um, and also ask for help. Um, you're the first one in your family navigating higher ed. You're not expected to know everything. Question, ask questions, you learn through the process. So again, you're in graduate school, you're in San Jose State right now to learn. Um, graduate school is the same thing, you're learning, you're uh, practicing skills as you're building community. So definitely know why you're doing this and ask for help in the process. You're not alone, people are here to help you, your professors are here to help you. So definitely go to them, ask them questions and get the support that you need. Beautiful, thank you. Diana, same question to you again as well. What advice would you give to someone considering going to grad school? Um, so two things. First, I would share Matt's advice like I did earlier. If you're going to go to grad school, the program should serve you and your future goals. Um, I think that was a really good piece of advice that I would share with anybody that asked me. So just considering that, making sure that the program has something for you, that it's aligned with what you want to do, and that it feels like the right fit for you anywhere that you apply. Um, that's first and foremost, because like Giovanna said, it's important to have a why behind it, or else you're going to burn out, you're going to feel unmotivated, you're not going to want to stick with it if there's not something in it for you, or you're not passionate about what you're doing. And then second, I would say, um, figure out if it's going to be best for you to go straight out of undergrad or if you want to wait a while, work for a little bit and then see if your company will pay for it. It's a big undertaking um, going along with the earlier advice. Um, sorry, I got kind of stuck. But going along with the earlier advice, I think you really need to know why you're doing it and why you're taking out that money and if it's going to be the right time for you. If you just feel like, oh, I need to go because that's the next step. I don't have a plan for after graduation. I don't feel ready. Um, don't let that be your reason for going. Make sure that it's the right time. Make sure that it's the right program for you. And then um, once you do get there, if that is your choice to go straight there or even after, just Make sure that you believe in yourself once you're there because it does get hard. We've talked about imposter syndrome. We've talked about um, being Christian and how that affects you and kind of feeling out of place either inside or outside of the classroom. So making sure that you're keeping that confidence once you, once you get to your program and that it's the right time and the right program for you and your, your path that you're taking. All right, and with that, before we can transition to Q&A, can we just please give our panelists a round of virtual applauses, please, for their insightful, their thoughtful, and just overall, just very lovely responses to sharing with it with you all today. Like they come from such diverse, but also like the messages have been very similar, but they both bring their, again, their intrinsic value to the table. And again, like, like I said before, their community that they intend to serve is so lucky to have them as passionate as they are, just using this grad program to leverage themselves to push them forward as they're, trying to serve who they want to serve. 